a first century Jewish understanding of the Messiah is that the Messiah will come in person to his temple. You mean of Malachi 3? Yeah. Um, Oh well, you know, Mohammed's like unto Moses because he had a mum and his dad, well so did Napoleon. Mohammed's like unto Moses because he brought a new law, well so did Napoleon. Because I've got prophecies that point clearly to Jesus, that you agree Jesus fulfills those prophecies. And on the ones that are disputed, I just say that the authority of the church outranks the authority of the rabbis. You tell me which string, which string did that? Please tell me. Go on. Which string did I don't that? know. You don't know? I don't know. Your that. friend said Guinness. Now ask your friend why he knows what Guinness smells like. <laughs> just before I go, show me the verse in the Bible that says the rabbis have the interpretation. Jesus has to be the Messiah because he's the only one that can fulfill the prophecies about the temple because the temple has been destroyed. Yes. But that's the basic um, synthesis. Uh, sorry, thesis. Let me get my words right. Now, now uh, no, how, how, what's your basic reply to that? My basic reply is that the prophecies with regards to the temple, um, I, I'm assuming you mean being rebuilt. Um, well, the temple's got to be there. Right. No, I'm not talking about the temple being rebuilt. You're talking to someone who doesn't believe that the temple necessarily has to be rebuilt. Ah, right. So, okay, so you're more of a, of a, a heavenly temple. No, the, so the temple for me as a Christian is, Jesus, right? is the whole, no. The temple for me is, is the body of the church. Uh, so I'm the temple. He's the temple. He is the temple. He is the temple. Right. This is where God tabernacles now. He, he tabernacles in his people which is which is which he which he which he uh he he is, is what he promises he promises that he'll tabernacle amongst his people does he not? Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah i mean that is what he does yeah he says i'll dwell amongst you yes well i mean and, and in the past that was in the ark of the covenant then it was in the temple itself then the first temple was destroyed then a second temple was built and if yeah. if i remember my tanakh correctly and please correct me if i'm wrong it says that they built it, but he didn't have the glory of the first temple. Yeah, that's true. Right. But then it, it, the, there's prophecies about the Messiah coming that link the Messiah to the temple. Right, yes. Yes? Which means that the temple has to be there. Right. And it, and it also says that the, the Messiah will establish the kingdom of God across the world, does it not? Yes. That he will uh, rule over the Gentiles, does yes. it not? And that he will, that, that all the nations will come to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh. Is that true? Indeed. Right. Now, would you agree with me that since the time of Jesus, Gentiles across the whole world have been calling Jesus their king, have been believing in themselves, whether you agree with it or not, but they believe within themselves that they're worshiping Yahweh and that they've gone to Jerusalem to do so? Yeah. The pilgrims. That's that's just, that's, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, I plan to go to Jerusalem. Right. Most Christians I know have planned to go to Jerusalem. Right. So yeah. So yes. Yeah, so yeah, now, yeah, would you helped. would you agree? Not about all of the all of the kingdoms of the earth, but. Uh, well, I mean, but, right now there are Christians that are coming um, from all around the world to Jerusalem. Yeah, that's, that's a true. thing. That's true. Yeah, and, they're, and they're, right, they're coming from everywhere. Yeah. Like Argentina to Japan to yeah. Russia, to South Africa, they, they go to Jerusalem. Yeah. So would you agree with me that a, a prima facie reading of the text, I can say that those prophecies have been fulfilled in the person of Jesus? No. On what grounds? The reason is because those are not the only prophecies that, that have, to be, have to be examined in order to work out who the person of the Messiah is. We'll, we'll come to that, we'll come to that in a second. I'm about to come to that in a second. What I'm saying to you, but, but let's just deal with those prophecies okay, that right. I presented. Okay. On the Same. basis of those prophecies, okay. can I say that those prophecies have been fulfilled since the time of the Messiah Jesus? So if we say that those are the only prophecies, right, if we ignore everything else, yep. then uh, right, that, 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 that's all the Messiah is basically. Yes. Um, and contrary to the people who go and worship in Jerusalem, then yes. But since that's not the case, 
No. Okay. Right. So, so your argument is not disputing whether these prophecies have been fulfilled. Your argument is that there are other prophecies that are not fulfilled. Yes, and that, okay. the reason, and that because those other prophecies are not fulfilled, therefore we cannot say that the person of the Messiah is Jesus, in which case this prophecy is also not fulfilled. Okay, so, so what, 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 firstly, are you going to be pulling prophecies that the rabbis taught in the Talmud connected to um, what prophecies weren't fulfilled? Are you going to be using the Talmud? No, I'm not going to be using the Talmud. So, so the pro who, who define, who gets to say what are the prophecies connected to the Messiah and what aren't? I think the, I think the baseline is what, uh, is what we would call the simple understanding of the text. Which is the, what I said by prima facie. Right. So in the simple understanding of the text, right, so for example, like if I were to bring up Isaiah 7.14 for example, so yeah. I would say that does not simply talk about the Messiah. Let, let, let's right? pull that up. let's have a look. Right, but, but in terms of... In where, whereas we would agree that Isaiah chapter 11 would be talking about the Messiah. Right. right. So, it, 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 would, it wouldn't be based on Talmudic basis, it would be based on what does the text actually imply? What does the text imply? So, no, no, the thing is, both of us appeal to authorities outside of ourselves. Yes, that's true. You, you appeal to the rabbis, yes. I appeal to the authority of the church. Yes. Okay? Now, uh, you believe that uh, the rabbis have the authority given by God to interpret the Tanakh. Indeed. Yeah. That God gave them that authority. Yes. And that's why they, they can even appear to contradict the Tanakh and still be right. Yes. Right. We, yeah. Fair enough. I believe that the church has that authority. Yes. To interpret the Bible. Yes. So now the question is, in in look, where would we find the depository of the rabbinic, rabbinic authority, rabbinic literature? Right, so rabbinic literature would be mainly in the Talmud. Right, when is the Talmud dated to? The Talmud is dated to, I don't know, maybe like 600 CE. So it's a 5th or, or 7th century document? Something like that, yeah. Right. But the New Testament, we would both agree, is dated to the 1st century? Yeah. And this was written by Jews, was it not? Uh, very possibly. Right. So I have a document from the 1st century written by Jews that have a 1st century understanding of what was and was not Messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. You have, as your source, a 5th century AD document telling you what are prophecies of the Messiah and what are not. So that, uh, so Is that fair? Almost, almost. Almost fair. Because because the Talmud does not tell us which prophecies are messianic and which ones are not. Because the Talmud is not interested in telling us about how to understand the simple understanding of prima facie, as you would say, understanding of the Tanakh. Right? That's not the job of the Talmud. The, the, the rabbis have been very clear that, that the Talmud is, in terms of interpretation of the Tanakh, primarily working on a homiletical level. Yeah. Right? Whereas, to, right, known in Hebrew as drush, yep. but in the Pshat level, which is the prima facie, the simple contextual meaning, that's something that can be observed by anyone who reads, who, who picks up the book. Yeah. Right. That's why I was saying before that I won't be appealing to Talmud because I'm not interested right now in, in pulling out hom homilies that can be derived. I'm interested in talking about what the prophecy actually is saying itself. Okay. So I mean, we'll, we'll start looking into some of the Old Testament texts for sure. But, but I, I just want to say that I don't think that you will ever be able to interpret any of the Old Testament without even indirectly leaning on the authority of the Talmud. The authority of the rabbis, yes. And, and that means, for me, right. right, that I'm leaning on a first century Jewish interpretation of the Old Testament. Right. And you're leaning on a fifth century Jewish interpretation of the Old Testament. And so I think that I have good grounds to argue that mine is more appropriate to the time and place that we're now about to discuss than yours. Because the rabbis, regardless of um, anything you might say, the rabbis were living in a hostile environment in which they had to equip the Jews to resist the polemics of the Christians. Right. Is that fair? written in Christian Europe or even in Christian Palestine. It was written in Babylon, yep. right, which was under Zoroastrian rule at the time, and which was, they, they did not have to deal with Christians in Babylon under Zoroastrian rule at the but time. But the, co the copies of the Talmud 
or data to the fifth century. And so that would have gleaned the way that they were copied, gleaned the way that they were interpreted, gleaned the way that it was understood. Right. Yeah, because the Jewish community, by this time, I think, probably started feeling the first pressures of being in a Christian society. Am I the way the Constantine was? 325. So, by the, so once it's coming into Europe... It was under Theodosius II, right. I think, if I'm not wrong, Theodosius II, that Christianity finally triumphs in the Roman right. Empire. Constantine simply makes Christianity state acceptable. Religion. No, it doesn't make it a state religion. It makes it an, an accepted state religion. One of many. Right. It was Theod I think it was Theodosius II yes. or Justinian II. 380. That, 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 that establishes Christianity as the religion of empire. Ah, right. Okay, so you do make a fair point. Fair, fair point. Okay. Um, I think I mean, it's just important to contextualise now what we're about to talk about when we interpret the Old Testament. Right. So now would you like to go to a particular passage? Sure. Which passage would you like to go to? So let's go to Isaiah 7 14. Okay. Right, which is one of the places where we argue. What do we argue about? Because like, to, to be honest, I don't really debate many Jews, to be honest. That's not my prime goal in coming down to the corner. I'm much more interested in taking on the Dawah team and their lies about the Christian faith. I, I think there are other ministries dedicated to the Jewish people that do a far better job than myself. You know, but I'm happy to talk with you. So, um, chapter seven, chapter seven verse, verse fourteen. Verse fourteen. Go right. on. So this is something that the Gospel of Matthew. I'm yeah. sure you're yeah. fully aware. Yeah. Quotes. Yes. Um, the very first chapter. Yes. Right. So as you can see, it says that this young woman, yeah. or in your translation, a virgin. Yeah. Um, is uh, is going to give birth yep. to a son, and it, the name's going to be Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Yeah. So a Christian like yourself would argue, based on the authority of the church, yep. that this is a messianic prophecy. Correct. Now, do you believe that? Actually, before that, because you you said before that we believe that the rabbis are able to interpret and they have the authority to interpret even if it seems like they might be contradicting. Yes. Right? Do you also believe that with regards to the church? Um, no, the church doesn't contradict. The, I don't believe that the church contradicts the scripture. No, no, I'm but they, they can have appear to. They can have they can have metaphor well they use analogous interpretations of scripture. Like for instance the Ark of Noah, Noah's Ark. Yes. They say that this is a type of Christ that it represents and symbolizes Christ in the Old Testament because Christ is the Ark that we run to to fear God's judgment. So they have this kind of metaphorical interpretation of the Old Testament. Right. So, Symbolic interpretation. I can't think of the academic term. So is that what, so put me here in Isaiah chapter 7, the yeah. context is talking about um, the siege going on in Jerusalem yep. and Isaiah comes and says to King Ahaz, yep. um, ask for a sign, he says, no thanks, yep. he says, I'm going to give you one anyway, yep. this young woman's going to give birth to a son. And he's going to call he's him the name of Emmanuel. Emmanuel yeah. right? And by the time this young this, this boy is able to know the difference between, uh, between the good and evil, and he's going to be eating butter and milk and whatnot, yep. um, the, the siege will be lifted, basically. Yep. Um, so would you as a Christian say that the, the simple meaning of verse 14 is talking about the Messiah or would you actually say no, it's actually simply an analogous meaning that so Matthew I, is drawing yeah, So I, I would say that the, 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 the text is talking about an event that happened in history during this time of the siege. So there was a young woman who did have a child that was called Emmanuel that was assigned to that king at that time just as God says. But the church by its authority also sees in that a, a, a reflection of what happened to Mary. That she was a young woman, and would you agree that a young woman who was unmarried at that time was most likely a virgin? Probably, yeah. yeah. That, uh, 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 so therefore the church is right to use, and they were probably quoting the Septuagint, which was a Jewish translation in the Greek that says virgin, that, 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 that is also a prophecy of Christ, because if it says a virgin shall be with child, using the Septuagint, the only virgin that these people know about is Mary, that has a child, then they would be, would you agree that they would be right to see that as a prophecy? Right. 
I, I hear you, I hear you. Um, so, a few points. You said, based on what you said, you said the Septuagint translates it as as, uh, as virgin, right? So the Greek word there is parthenos. And the word parthenos can mean both virgin and young woman. It's a, it's a similar issue, right? And I think that's that actually where the confusion started. But it's, it's but not the, unfair to translate or understand it, yeah, parthenos it's, as virgin. It's, it's not unfair to go. understand it as virgin. I would point out, however, the fact that in one occasion, when the word Parthenos is used by the Septuagint, yep. it seems like it certainly cannot be purchased in one particular instance. And that's where the Septuagint comes in Genesis chapter 34, yep. um, which is of course the story of Dina, yep. the daughter of Jacob. Yep. It was raped by Shechem. Yep. And over there, the verse immediately after she was raped, yep. um, where she's called, again, a young woman, so it's quite a different Hebrew term, for it, and the Greek Septuagint, first has a parthenos after she was raped. Yeah, and so, so, so I, I, I would say that whilst it's not unreasonable to translate parthenos yeah, as virgin in Isaiah seven fourteen, I would say that it's that it's not it, it, even that's not definite. Well, I, but but not definite is not the same as unreasonable. And and there's been countless academic scholars, both Christian and non-Christian that would agree that you can translate it as virgin. Yeah, you know, I'm, sure resting, you can. I'm resting on good yeah. academic grounds I, I, here. I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not even, it's not even slightly troubling yeah, yeah. this not, line I'm not, of I'm not saying it's discussion. unreasonable. I'm simply, say, I'm not simply saying that it's not, it's not definite. That's yeah. all I'm saying. But, but my point is, the, the point is, words are understood by their context. So if we're talking about a young woman where the context about the story of the one young woman is that she's never had sexual intercourse, we could understand that word to mean virgin. I, in Matthew. In, in Matthew, yes. Exactly. But if we understand that verse in a context in which, like you've given the example, where she's raped, then we would understand the, the word to be young woman. Right. So words are understood in their context. Right, I hear. Right. So when it talks about a virgin will be with child, bear in mind we're talking about Mary, this verse has been applied to Mary. The church understood that Mary had not been married, had not had sexual intercourse, therefore it can be rightly translated as virgin. Right. Now, if we've got a passage in the Old Testament that's talking about a young woman that does have a son called Emmanuel, which I believe happened in history before Jesus Christ, I, I, I really believe that. I believe there was a young woman at that time who had a baby called Emmanuel, and that was a sign to that king. But then, if hundreds of years later, a community encounters a woman that's had a child without having sex, and they look into the Old Testament, and they believe that the child is Emmanuel, as in God with us, and they look into the Old Testament, and they find that there is a sign that will be given to you, a child will be born of a virgin who will be called Emmanuel, I think they're not being unfair to call that prophecy. Ah, so it's, it, it really is a fundamental well, how you see Jesus? issue as to what exactly prophecy is. Right? Is prophecy um, something that is hinted by a verse, or is prophecy something which is explicit in a verse? Yes. I mean, because the thing is, in terms of in terms of how all religious communities use their text, all religious communities use their text, including prophecies. You know, when, for instance, um, in Deuteronomy, I think it's eighteen fifteen, and it says that a, a, a one will come to you, a prophet like unto Moses. If you look at the if you look at the Gospel of John, and you look in the first chapter, it's clear that the Jewish people at that time did not have a clear understanding. It, because remember that John is a first century document, so let's go to chapter one. Yeah. It, it, it's not clear at that time that they had a, a particular clear understanding of the implications. Let me just show you what I mean. So, John 1, verse 19 it reads. Can you just bear with us? Let me just make sure that I found it. Okay, so John says, this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed, and I, he did not deny but confessed, I am not the Christ. 
they asked, what, are, what then? Are you Elijah? Because lots of Jews thought Elijah would come back in person. Yeah. Yes. Right? But then they go on and say, and he said, I am, I am not. Are you the prophet? So there was a school of thought that thought that the prophet like unto Moses was not going to be the Messiah, but a distinct and different figure. Very interesting. But just because they have that opinion doesn't mean that the prophet like unto Moses is not the Messiah. Because would you right. agree that Moses was the saviour of the Jewish people? Yes. That he was the salvation of the Jewish people? The salvation? No. He saved them from slavery. Yeah, right. saved them. He does. That's, that's, okay. He's got the salvation. Let, let, let's just. He wrought the salvation. Fair enough. He wrought the salvation. Salvation came through the person of Moses. Yeah. Great. Well, we say that salvation came through the person of Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah. So, you know, in that way, Christ is like unto Moses. So, when we talk about similarities, yeah. Um, so when I say that X is similar to Y. So there'll be different possible similarities that we could understand as to why is it that X is similar to Y. Yeah. So when Moses says, God says, in verse 15 or verse 18, he's speaking in the yeah. verse, yeah. Um, that there'll be a prophet like that, Moses. That, that is similar to Moses. Yeah. So the question then is, in what way is it similar? Yeah. Is it going to be similar in the way, right, um, I hear a lot of Muslims talk about it being some law, or is it going to be similar in in a way that, um, like what you are saying, which is that he will um, bring salvation. Um, I would say that one of the similarities between Jesus and Moses is that he spoke to God face to face. Right. So that's very interesting because, and it's very interesting that you would say that. Um, I would have expected you to say he's put the Father face to face. Well, yeah, that's what I mean by that. Oh, okay. this is the, I mean, the Christians are not particularly helpful when we talk about the Trinity because our language about the Trinity developed before any of the arguments about the Trinity. Oh, right. So we ended up with a language about the Trinity before the Trinity became a disputed thing. And then our apologetics came after oh. the tradition of the language. And so we have this all slight disconnect between our apologetical understanding and our linguistic construct. Right. Okay. So whenever I speak of God in and Jesus in the same sentence, you should probably understand in most instances that what I'm talking about is the Father and right. Jesus. Okay. Uh, will do. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 34. Yeah, I'm talking about Joshua. Um, Joshua. Actually, that after it talks about Joshua. After it talks about Joshua. Yeah. So it says in verse 10, yeah. it's the, the verse after it talks about Joshua, um, it's the third last verse of the Pentateuch, yes. it says, Never again did there arise in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord singled out face to face. So yeah. over there we have um, a similarity being pointed out yes. um, with Moses that no other prophets would have. Yes. Right? So what I would say, and of course, it, that's not how the church sees it, but what I, how I would say, and how the rabbis also see it, is that that cannot be the similarity being referred to in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Otherwise, we would have a contradiction between the two verses. No, we wouldn't. The, 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 the passage, when we, when we look at, sorry, sorry, it's 24, what? 34. 24, 34. No, th 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 chapter 34. Sorry, chapter 34. Chapter 34. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I have the same problem. In 34, verse 10. Verse 10. They shall teach. Mm -hmm. no. no. Chapter 30, Deuteronomy. 34, there we go. Deuteronomy 34, verse 10. Thank you. I'll there we go. Since that time, no prophet has arisen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. So that's from the writing of Deuteronomy. Yes. So from the writing of Deuteronomy up to the up to from, from Joshua up to the time that this passage is written. When do you believe it was written? Well, I mean, the, 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 the text of scripture in mosaic text of scripture, because that's what we're talking about here. The, there's different, there's different, um, there's both all, the, the, 
there's both oral traditions and written traditions within Deuteronomy that come from Moses. The oral traditions didn't all arrive in Deuteronomy at the time of Moses. So, do you agree that there's an oral tradition of Moses? Yeah, absolutely. Do you agree that some of those found their way into the writings of Moses after the time of Moses? No. Okay, fair enough. So, this, this text, now that Joshua the son of Nun was filled with the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, and the sons of Israel listened to him, and did as the Lord had commanded Moses, since that time, that's talking about Joshua. Yes. Right? Since that time, no prophet has arisen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, for all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent to him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all of his servants, and all of his land. And from all the mighty power and for all the great terror which Moses performed, in the sight of Israel. So, I'm, I'm gonna take back what I said about the, the Deuteronomical phrases, um, those, those passages, because I'm using a literary argument that is not gonna stand up. So I'll take that back. The, the signs and the wonders that Moses performed, did Joshua perform them? Um, he performed some of them. He, uh, because we have the splitting of the Jordan. Splitting of the Jordan? Yes. Yeah, the locusts. The wall of Jericho? The plagues? No. The, the wall of Jericho so came down. Th this passage here is saying that for all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent to him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all his servants and all his land. Yes. But Joshua didn't do these things. Indeed. It's saying there would be, it, there, there is no, no there, there would be no prophet like Moses who does who does these things. Yeah, can, can I right? call it has got a list of different things. The, the, right? the, 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 yeah, a list of different things. Yes. The, the prophet. The, I mean, was Joshua a prophet? Yes. Okay, fair enough. I just want to understand your position, right. because for me, it doesn't strike me that this is excluding a another prophet from seeing God face to face. It's saying that a prophet has not done the works of Moses. Right. Whom the Lord knew face to face, for all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent to him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all of his servants and all of his land. Right. So, ah, so I hear what you're saying. So basically what you're saying is that Correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like what you're saying is that it's not that all the similarities to Moses um, are. It, it, it's not that there will not be a prophet who will not have any of these similarities. It's that there will not be a prophet who has all of these similarities. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I would say that was fair. Right. So now the thing is, as Christians, we believe that Christ does speak face to face with the Father. Right. So but the fact that Joshua knew. Um, Joshua knew the Lord face to face, or the, fa the Lord knew Joshua face to face. Uh, Joshua did not know. Right, right. So then Joshua is not like Moses, then, is he? Indeed. I'm not, I'm not claiming that Joshua is like this. But I'm saying that Jesus is like Moses. And isn't that the whole argument that we're having? No, what, the, the reason I brought this up, the reason I brought this verse we're up. not following you. Right. So I brought this verse up to say that knowing God face to face yes. is a similarity to Moses. Yes. That is not going to be from another prophet. Well, I'm saying it's more than other miracles. Right, I hear you. Um, so, then the question is, which similarities then is Deuteronomy 18 talking about? Right, but would you agree that you, you can you can have a reading of this verse where it's actually the other signs and wonders that have been talked about here? I... Since I, I, that right, yeah. time, so, so, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. So that's an ascription to Moses. Um, face to face. For all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent to him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all of his servants and all his land. Very so interesting. Um, I think... Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? 
Well, I'll leave, I'll, leave, I'll, leave it out, I'll leave that out for interpretation. The way I would look at this is that there's a few different similarities here. The given, and that knowing him face to face is one of them. But I do hear what you're saying. I don't think it's totally outside of the business. Right, and, and I'm saying that the, the way that Christ is likened to Moses, I actually did a video of all the different ways that Christ is likened to Moses. Right. So, one is that they are the saviour of Israel. Moses saved Israel from slavery to Egypt. Christ saves Israel and the rest of the world from slavery to sin. Right. Um, Moses spoke to God like a friend directly. You know, he knew God face to face. Christ, the divine Logos, the Word of God, knew the Father face to face. Um, uh, I mean, I can't think of other ones off the top of my head, but there's there's lots of them. the important ones are more the sort of the um, meta narrative kind of. Those are the important ones, the meta-narrative statements about Moses and about Jesus. Not that, you know, one was born and with a mother, because if you start reducing, as the Muslims do, it's kind of like, oh well, you know, Muhammad's like unto Moses because he had a mum and his dad, well so did Napoleon. Muhammad's like unto Moses because he brought a new law, well so did Napoleon. And Muhammad went and conquered the world, you know, Muhammad conquered and, and led armies, well so did Napoleon. You know, so I like this one. This is very good. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, we, so I agree with you on that. It's not in worldly things. It's about the the deep meta structures of the narrative that surrounds Moses and the narrative that surrounds Jesus. Moses was persecuted as a child. Our Lord was persecuted as a child. Yeah. Moses um, grew up in Egypt. Christ grew up in Egypt. You know, um, just trying to think of. I, I seriously want you to watch the video. I'll try and get um, JC to link it. Where I come up like forty odd different reasons why Moses is is like unto Jesus. Um, so I don't have to believe the worst. That's, that's very good what you're saying. Um, and I'm not going to dispute that even according to our interpretation of Deuteronomy 18.15 as to what exactly is the similarity that is being referred to. They both got to be um, Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, an important one. Yeah. So, so according to according to our interpretation, right, Jesus is not automatically um, um, outside of the realms of verse 15 because according to what we say, the similarities that uh, are being posited that the that prophets will have is that they'll be just like Moses is from your brethren in your midst, right? So too, Jesus will be, sorry, not <laughs> my goodness, so too the prophets or pro prophets will be um, the Jewish. brethren in your midst, right? Yeah, it's got to be and Jewish. The two things they are brethren, which is Jewish, and yeah. in your midst. And he's got to speak in the name of Yahweh. Indeed. Because any prophet that doesn't speak into a Yahweh should be killed. Yes. And, and Jesus spoke in the name of Yahweh. Yeah. Um, and in your midst means within the land of Israel as well. Uh, which, which Jesus was yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so I, I'm not going to say that he falls outside of that in that particular verse. Okay, so we've got we've got one where we, so we we could get Jesus in there. You could get him in there. Yeah. The problem is I, I go, in Isaiah though. I, I would still say we've got two because Jesus. We can get Jesus in there as well. Not, not in the prima facie way, in the way you want to say it's a hint. Uh, yeah, there's, 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 there's all the way through the Old Testament, there are arrows pointing towards Jesus. The Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Well, if we go to Mika, yeah. chapter 5. Mika chapter 5. In your, in your version, it will be verse 2. Okay. Mine will be verse 1. Let me just find it, because I'm getting cold. I still have no idea how it happened, but we took the chapter verse system from the Christians and yet, <laughs> and yet we ended up with slightly different verse numbers in, different, in various chapters. I still don't know how that happened, but uh, there you go. Well, communities but, uh, tend to want to separate themselves. Because uh, most of the time it's exactly the same numbering system, but in various places it's different. Um, Nika, chapters 4 and 5 is, not, uh, it is it's one of those strange places. But uh, in the beginning of chapter 5, 
Mika chapter 5. Yours is verse 2. Yeah. It says here, And you, O Bethlehem of Ephrath, least among the clans of Judah, from you one shall come forth to rule Israel for me, on his origin of all his ancient times. Now I can hear, I can hear an interpretation, which is the interpretation of yourself yep. and the church, yep. that it refers to somebody being born in Bethlehem, but I don't see it as something which is, um, which is, um, um, it's a car <laughs> exploding. Which <laughs> is something um, that the text has to be interpreted as. Um, the, we know that David came from Bethlehem, Jesse came from Bethlehem. Yep. And something coming forth from Bethlehem, right? What is origins of old ancient times, does not necessarily mean he was born there. It could mean that his ancestry is from there. Well, I, I would say that there's that one of the reasons why the church goes to this is because and, and central to how we interpret the Old Testament is, is who do we say Jesus is. So, like, when it says, but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth from me to be ruler of Israel, his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity, is also how it can be translated. Now we say that the divine Logos is eternal, that, that, that Christ took to himself a humanity. So he is from eternity, and he goes forth from eternity. And Christ claims to have come from heaven, come from the Father, who is eternal. We actually say, are there, are there any other Jews that have made a similar claim? Um, not to that extent, but... Are there any Jewish kings that have made the claim to have come from eternity? No, no. Right, well, Jesus, Jesus understood himself to be king of the Jews. Right. And he claimed to come from eternity. So we believe that the name of the, 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 the part of the Messiah, which is which is from before time began, is the name of the Messiah. We believe that that God created a number of things before He created um, before He created the heavens and the earth. Yeah. Um, and one of those things was the name of the Messiah. What exactly that means, I don't know. Um, it's one of those more esoteric things of the rabbinic tradition. Um, I think. I think what could probably help you on that is to consider the fact that the Messiah in the Old Testament is a divine figure. Ah. So, so in Daniel, in Daniel chapter seven, we've got the ancient of days. I mean, you know the passage. I know the passage. Do we need to go to it? The, the, the ancient of days is there on his throne, and then one is presented like unto him. One is presented unto him, and the ancient, uh, the ancient of days, one like the son of man. To whom yeah, the sorry, kingdom sorry. is given, yeah. and all nations yeah. bow down, yeah. reverence, and worship him. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'm not. I'm not misquoting yeah, that passage. Yeah. yeah. So this is this is this is, and he sits at the right hand of the ancient of days. The right hand. I don't think it says that maybe, here. Does it? Maybe I'm just uh, thinking of another passage. I, 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 I think you're referencing Psalm 110. Yes. That's sorry. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. So um, in Isaiah 7, I don't think I don't. To be honest, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, um, it, it, it's not, once again it's not necessarily saying that this person is divine because dominion, glory and kingship are given to him yep. but if you look at who else it's given to yep. um, in, the, in the attendance explanation of Daniel's vision at the end of the chapter in verse uh, let's go from verse 25 I think yep, 25 uh, Sorry, verse 26. Then the court will sit and his dominion will be taken away from the shoulder of the Verse 27. The kingship and dominion and grandeur belonging to all the kingdoms under heaven will be given to the people of the holy ones of the most high. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. So I don't think we're going to say now that the, that the people of the holy ones of the most high are also divine simply because king, ki, because everlasting kingdom um, and all dominions serving and, uh, and uh, worshipping them, obeying them, um, is, uh, is um, 
it is making them divine. Sorry, most high, and where down the saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given unto his hand for a time, times and half a time, but the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away and annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people and of the saints of the highest one. Do you know that Christ promises his followers that they will rule with him? I do not. Yes, that's exactly what Jesus says. He says that though that his apostles will be the judges of the 12 tribes of Israel. We Christians believe in a concept called theosis, which is that we participate in the divine energy. So you actually, ah, so the question I was throwing out, you actually say, well, yes, you do believe that there is a divinity to the We participate the in the divine energy, yes. So even so much so that Athanasius says that, that you know, man, uh, God became man so that man can become a god. So now we've got to be clear because this, this has to be understood properly. We're not saying that we become a god in the Mormon sense like the Mormons do, where we get our own planet. It's like if I take a knife and I stick it in a fire, the knife will take on the properties of the fire without becoming fire itself. Right. So it takes on the properties of fire without being fire. So, and that's what Athanasius is talking about. He's taking that we take on the properties of God, we participate in the energies of God without becoming God himself. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, so, so this, this still works for me. Right. Um, so the way I would interpret... But would you agree that this is not an ordinary man? This just isn't a normal man that's being described in verses 13 to 14? I would agree he's, not, he's certainly not normal. How many people have uh, everyone worshipping them? And, uh, yeah. Obeying them? Would you agree with me that, 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 that worship, divine worship, worship that's joined unto Yahweh is only proper to Yahweh? Um, that type of worship, yes. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say that this is necessarily the same worship that would be given to God. Um, I would argue that it is, but, but uh, for, for, for the sake of ease, because, right, so I kept looking at the night visions and behold the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him and to him was given dominion, glory and the kingdom that all the people's nations, men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. So it's an eternal kingdom. Now, if it's eternal, that means that he's participating in a divine something, isn't he? I, 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 can, I can go and meet you halfway and say that Messiah is certainly participating in something which is divine. Thank you. But I would not then go uh, a step further and say that Messiah himself is divine. No, we would have to look at other verses for right. that. So shall I take you to one? Sure. Right, now you're going to have to help me because your knowledge of the Old Testament is better than me. Um, and I can't find the passage because I haven't noted it all up yet in, in my Bible. We're looking for the passage where it says, I shall send my messenger before your, my face. And that, I believe, is Malachi chapter 3. Yeah, I thought it was now. just need to find it. Okay. Somehow I managed to open to the right page this time. So oh, wow, well done. That, that was useful. <laughs> it's nice talking to you. Yeah. This is, this is how conversations at Speaker's Corner should be. Indeed. You know, I, I want to pull you up on something, by the way. Yeah. Do you believe that, that God appeared to, um, just as a side topic while I find the passage, do you agree that God appeared to um, wrestled with Jacob? Um, God wrestled with him in a certain manner of speaking, i.e. that an angel of God wrestled with Jacob and that angels by their very nature are, message, are, are, are vehicles for God's voice. But does the, does the text say that... Okay, so, so does the text identify that angel as God? Um, in the Prima Fascia, reading. Um, yeah, I'll you do that, I'm going to find Malachi. I'm obviously skipping past it each time I try. Yeah. 
If yours, you'll probably end up with Matthew if you do that. Right, hold on one second. My hands are shot hold. You and me both. Um, because in, in the Prima Fascia, I'm pretty sure the angel is identified as Yahweh, that Yahweh is, is, is spoken of as the angel and vice versa. It's very possible. That's, uh, that, that's, uh, that's a primary dispute between us, which is the nature of theophanies. But, but if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're making an argument against the Messiah based on the plain text, then surely you must apply that plain text argument to the theophanies. Right, so... So that's why I need to have a look at the language because if it mentions the name, if it mentions the word Malach, which is the word for Hebrew, so if it was in Hebrew for angel, then I'm set for that, to be honest. Um, so I can still use my interpretation of, uh, of them being representatives of the divine and therefore being vehicles of God's voice in their very essence. Um, so in right, before you, we come back to that. Well, let's swing back to that. Okay. So we, I said I would show you something where it, it says that Yahweh, that the Messiah is divine. Sure. Okay? So this is God speaking. He says, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and Yahweh, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, which is the angel that we're going to start talking about, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says Yahweh of hosts. So Yahweh is saying that he is going to come to his temple. Yeah. What verse right? is that? That's in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. That's a part of the verse. Yeah. So, so there's a messenger that comes before, who we say is John the Baptist, and then Yahweh, incarnate as Jesus Christ, comes to his temple. And, what, who's and, and the covenant? first century church understood this to be a mess messianic prophecy. Yes, I think they quoted something. They yeah, they they yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. So, a first century Jewish understanding of the Messiah is that the Messiah will come in person to his temple. You mean of Malachi 3? Yeah. Um, again, I mean, so the thing is, you're arguing against other Jews. Well, yes. You're not arguing against Christians, you're arguing against Jewish Christians. Right, I mean, I, I, I do that when I argue against, uh, like if I have to argue against socialists, I argue against Karl Marx, he's also a Jew. Yeah. It's, it's not my, my, my such point, a big thing. My point, to you, my point to you is that this isn't a Gentile interpretation yeah, of the Old true. Testament, it's a Jewish interpretation of the Old Testament. Right. That's the right. point I'm making, and I think that's really important. I don't. Because, because... The Judaism of today, the Judaism of today owes more to the 5th century than it does to the 1st century. Um, I'm not so sure about that. The Christians, the Christians that wrote the New Testament went into the temple. Right, but a large number of the rabbis who are being talked about in the Talmud, who are being quoted in the Talmud, yeah. all that were, were around in the in before the first century, the first century itself, the second century, the third century. So they're, 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 it, it's a, the thing about the Talmud is it's a big span of conversation and of, uh, uh, of between the rabbis of a large number of centuries before the Talmud itself was finally collated. Yeah, but 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 remember, you you originally had said that the Talmud was written in Babylon, but now we're saying that it wasn't just written in Babylon. No, as in, it, as in the final thing of that's what my yeah. bet was the final thing of it was written in Babylon, right? It was compiled in Babylon, right? But it's it's quoting many things that had already been floating around before that. But you've just said that it also was written at the time of Babylon, after Babylon, the time of Jesus, and after Jesus. No. Okay. So what? what it's a, again. The Talmud is a compilation. Yes, right? I know that. So you have all of these discussions. Is it AD or BC or both? Is the Talmud? It's, so the, the literature of the Talmud. Is it all BC? Some of it's BC and some of it's uh, AD. After that. So it wasn't all written at, in Babylon, was it? 
No, great, because you did say at the, earlier in the conversation right. that it was. What I meant was the comp compilation was in that book. Because you asked a about compilation, this. because the, 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 the copy that we have today comes from the 5th century. As in the final compilation of the Babylonian Talmud that was finally put... In the Including Babylon. the texts after the, the exile in Babylon ended? No. As you say, some of the texts of the Talmud were written after Babylon. Which means that they had to be oh, written. Th th there's two times that we went to Babylon. Yeah. Right. I think this might be might be a confusion. Okay. Um, there's the time we went to Babylon after the destruction of the first temple. Yeah. Which was a long time before. Yes. Right. Then there's another time when the when the Romans came in yeah. and destroyed the temple, the second temple. Yeah. So Jews were scattered all over. All and over. And one of the main Jewish centers that was established was in Babylon. Yes. So that's the second time. Right. So all the writings in the the Talmud come from Babylon and are written in Babylon, both so, after and before Christ. So the compilation of of the Babylonian Talmud took place in Babylon. Yeah. And a large amount of the Talmud is is strictly Babylon. Yep. But there's a there's also a significant percentage of the Babylonian Talmud, which is quotations of things that had already happened earlier in Israel. Yep. Both after Jesus and before Jesus. Right. So so we've got so so yeah. So we've as I said, it's it, it is a it's a fifth century text. That, that there's fifth century interpretations that are inside the Talmud that I think influence how Jews understand the Old Testament, including how they understand the Messiah. I don't think you can right. escape the, from the, that. The, the, for sure, it certainly influences our interpretation of, um, of the Messiah, that's, yeah. that's for sure. Right, and that's important, because that is a fifth century Jewish perspective of the Messiah. Yes. But I'm using a first century Jewish perspective of the Messiah. But that's the thing. When we come to Dan, we're, we're, So this so, is why I'm using right. Micah 3, because Micah Malachi. 3 is talking... Sorry, my apologies, Malachi 3. Malachi 3 is talking about a, the Messiah, Yahweh himself, coming to his temple. And we see this as a Messianic prophecy. Right. Right, so, yeah, because the New Testament is understanding the Messianic. The question then is, why exactly is the New Testament understanding this as messianic? But what is it in the text itself that, that on prima facie understanding, that makes this messianic? So the authority to interpret the Old Testament, just like, and this is why I mentioned it, you believe Moses, and you, sorry, you believe that the rabbis were given the authority by God to interpret the Tanakh. Yes. We believe that the church has the authority to interpret the Tanakh. No. So, it's the same authority. God gives the authority to the church to interpret the Old Testament. Right. So really, at the end of the day, there's really, an, there's really a solid impasse. And we're, not going to be anything to get, get, we're not really going to be able to get past, which is the, which is the issue of the authority um, that I will believe has been given to the rabbis and you will believe has been given to the church. Right, but let's now look at some, go back to some of these prophecies that I mentioned. You, we both believe that the Messiah is going to be ruler of Gentiles. Yes. Ruler of the nations. Yes. That he's going to bring them to the worship of one God. Indeed. That God is Yahweh. Yes. That he's, they're going to come from around the world to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh. Yes. That they're going to be joined unto Israel. As in, in terms of they are going to worship the same God as Israel, participate in a new covenant. Do you believe that? That the uh, Messiah is going to bring a new covenant? Messiah will not bring a new covenant. Uh, do, do, uh, right, so in terms of... I mean, that, this might be a sideline point. Let's just stick to what the accomplishments of the Messiah will be. We can dispute about a new covenant right. later. The Messiah will bring the Gentiles to the worship of Yahweh. Jesus, do you know of any other Jew in the history of the Jewish people that have, apart from Jesus Christ, any other Jew that has brought Gentiles from around the world to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh? And who's also proclaimed as king, their king. 
considered king of the Gentiles. As in, the Gentiles are saying, this Jew is my king. Right. No. No. Would you say that Jesus Christ fits that description? He does fit that description, yes. Right. So, <laughs> we've got clear evidence in favour of Jesus being the Messiah, and then we've got arguments about some prophecies not being fulfilled, but those arguments originate based upon who we say has the authority to interpret the Tanakh. Yes. You say the rabbis, we say the church. Yes. And that's the point. So I am I would say in this discussion, I'm, I don't know what, what percentage to give it, let's just say 50. I'm 50% 50 ahead because I've got prophecies that point clearly to Jesus, that you agree Jesus fulfills those prophecies. And on the ones that are disputed, I just say that the authority of the church outranks the authority of the rabbis. So I'm not saying that he fulfills it, I'm saying that he fits those particular descriptions. Yeah. Just get that. But, but I, I do hear what you're saying, I do hear what, what you're saying. Um, so then the issue would be about this issue of authority and how exactly we get to the position, how exactly you get to the position that the church has a God given authority and how exactly I get to the position that the rabbis have a God given authority. God has to give it to you. Right. So then, should we go into that then? Yeah. Jesus Christ is God. He says that the church has the power, the authority to interpret. By the power and how do you know that? that Jesus is God. God. Jesus, well, how, how do you know that Jesus is God? Yeah. So, um, Jesus makes claims about himself that he is God, that are testified yeah, to yeah, by yeah, the yeah, power yeah. of the Jeff resurrection. You had a really good conversation about authority. They, 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 they just came out. Sorry, no, 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 I'm not interrupting. I'm okay. not interrupting. I'm just saying. Um, what? We had a really good conversation with Mohammed Hijab yeah. about authority. There you go. He is interrupting. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying. I'm just saying that like, you did have a good conversation about, you're talking about authority and chain of, um, of of keeping, and you mentioned obviously yeah. rabbi's authority. Yeah. Yes, I'm just yes, saying. Yes, we did. Just, I think he wants very, to advertise you, a Mohammed Hijab conversation. Yeah, you could say that. Like <laughs> you exactly like you advertised yeah. uh, advertise a lot of gambling. It's just using this. It's all right. We'll get JC to edit out this entire section so that. Gets JC to we'll, edit out we'll the edit, fact that Mary out never worshipped Jesus. Yeah. Obviously, you don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah, but you ignore him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Like you were saying it's, about Islamic my mother. Supremacy. That's how your mother we're, raised we're, you. We're, Is yeah. that how your mother I'm raised you? Showing again, your mother didn't raise you. I'm just showing it again. Your mother, you. you. again, your yeah, mother yeah, didn't raise you with any manners. Why do you have to do this? You guys carry on. Why do you have to do this? You guys are also denying the Because if you don't have my permission to film, okay, you can carry on and you can you can edit stuff out and you can delete comments. Between you and I, I'm not bothered about camera and you can edit you can edit that Mohammed yeah. Ijab as well that's fine okay. by me thank you you're welcome please can we end the I'll, conversation thank I'll you very much you. thank you've you got your message so you. so go ahead yeah I, I mean because I I think that that <laughs> I, I I I mean I do want to come on to this theophany thing if we may because you you said that you said that you said to Mohammed Ijab that God hasn't entered into creation in a certain manner Are you speaking for all Jews there? Or do some Jews believe do some do Jews believe that God some Jews believe that God has entered into creation? But God has entered into, as, again, it's a very difficult statement to say God has entered into. Right? So let, let, let Moses Moses said Mo, Moses right. God said to Moses you can't see my face but you can see my back parts right. did Moses see the back parts of God did in Moses a see manner, God it's, it's a, okay, so that all depends on what exactly seeing is yeah right seeing as with your eyes is not what happened there yeah seeing as in oh, I see what you mean right a certain level of understanding of comprehension right that's what happened yeah it's okay. It, it just, you just got to ignore Jesus it. Jesus Christ is Lord. No. Like, no. It really is. It really is. Thank you, brother. Oh, no. He's just, he's, this guy's just triggered. Yeah. Just exactly. triggered. He's basically, sadly, he's showing, he's showing that his mother hasn't raised him properly. That's basically He's showing it. the fruit of his father. Yeah. All right, come on. Um, focus. Focus. Sorry. Uh, what were we saying? Go on. What were we saying? Um, <laughs> I've totally lost my chain of thought. So, so let, let, let's return. We, we, I, I would say we were saying that theophany, we haven't touched up. Yeah. No. So, so let's talk about the angel of the Lord. About God entering in creation. 
But the thing is that I think we're going to get to the same problem, which is the issue of authority. Yes. I think we should go into that the other. I think it's the more foundational point. Okay, so we, we, we agree that... We are, can you show me, for instance, where, considering there were no rabbis at the time of Moses, where, where we consider Moses to be the first rabbi. Is, we okay. call him Moshe Rabbi. Well, Moshe well, well, I guess, I guess it, if we say teacher, right. yes, then we could say Moses was a rabbi in that yeah. sense. Yeah. But yeah. rabbis have a particular function in Judaism today. That, that you know, carrying out yeah. circumcisions, looking after the synagogue. That's not a rabbi. All right, that's not a rabbi thing. No. So, uh, well, you don't have to be a rabbi to carry out the circumcision. Then you've taught me something about Judaism. Brilliant. The the, the function. The functions of um, a rabbi are not the same as the functions of a prophet. Oh, that's certainly true. That's certainly true. Sorry? That's certainly true. Yeah. So, uh, let's not get on to a mute point. He's started distracting me. He's, let's not, he's not, let's not get on to a, a moot point. About, he'll only follow us. He'll only follow us. Yeah. He's, he's really upset. He's really upset. So... And now he's threatening someone else over there as well. What, what do you expect, uh, Bob? What, what, what do you expect? Yeah, what do you expect? Yeah, he's talking to you like you. Are you, are you, are you trying to justify yeah, like you. No, no, he's like you. Are you trying to justify This is what you do. Maybe next time when I come, I'll ask you a question. Yeah, you can come and grab me straight away. Yeah. 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 Quickly, does he say kiss the sun in the book? Yes, in Psalm 2. No, 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 I think it's yes, man. Makes sense. Maybe it is. That was Joshua, the son of Nun. You know it. Well, I forget it. It says in Psalm 2. Makes sense. <laughs> it says. Your name is Where is it? Is it? Yeah. Yes, it is. Do Your homage to the sun. Please to meet you, Joshua. That he you not so become so angry you and you about? perish in, a way. Yeah. in the way. <laughs> and the, the one that's yeah, being referred to here okay, is okay. Yahweh. Okay. Because he says, worship religion, Yahweh with reverence and rejoice with Jesus. trembling. Do homage to the sun that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How and blessed are him. all who take refuge so, in him. Is that Jim, okay. is that so if you read Psalm 2, it's Deuteronomy talking about Yahweh. 28. Yeah. And it, it identifies that, Yahweh 18. with the sun. Uh, yeah. Turn to Deuteronomy well, you know 28 that, and, and see. Listen, I don't want to be but rude or anything, yeah. and, and I, I swear. But you know that he doesn't say kiss the sun. Well, well homage can he also... Said, no, 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 no. homage in purity. Yeah, no, no, hold on one second. Homage, like, homage, kissing the ring, Biachi Damani, kissing the ring is a way of doing homage. Kissing the ring of the man. Yeah, because when okay. you when you did homage to a king, okay. you would kiss their ring. Yeah. Hopefully next week or the week after, yeah. I'm gonna have a chat with doing, you. Doing homage to a king, you used to kiss their ring, so it okay. would be. Right. No that's worries. how you do homage. Okay, we'll talk next week. Yeah. Yeah. Go and check it out. How you do homage? I will. Or one of the ways. Deuteronomy you do fifth, Deuteronomy 28, 50, the Lord thy God shall write up a prophet like unto him. Who was that talking? He was talking about Jesus. Really? Prove that then. Oh, oh he was talking about I'm Jesus. I'm having a conversation with him. Yeah. But Sorry. Look, yeah, I, I no, always no, no. thought it was Jesus they were talking about. We're, we're, we're talking, um, we're having a conversation. Oh, sorry. Can sorry, we finish sorry. our conversation? All right, all right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Look, bro, I'm, I'm cold and I want to go to you. Yeah, same, to be honest. Yeah. So, do, we, we can pick What's this up again. Anyway? I don't know, late. We can pick this up again. But, but what I would say is that we do have this question of authority. That, that's yeah, something that's to go into. Yeah. And we have a question... Um, Oh, and I think that that question of authority underpins the prophecies that we disagree about. Yeah, I think it does. Think it so. really does. Absolutely. But we also have a whole bunch of prophecies where Jesus fits that description. Yes. We do. Yeah. But we also have a whole bunch that we haven't really got into yet that he does not fit into. Uh, and Which you then we believe go is, back. A, is a second coming. Well, we, 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 would, we would go back to the authority of who's got the right to exactly. the Tanakh. Exactly. You know? and, and, and on this one, I like, just, just very quickly, can you show me the verse where, where in the Bible where God says that the rabbis have the, interpre the, the right to interpret the Old Testament? Watch out! 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 Watch out
Oh, guys, guys, guys. Why are you touching me? I'll punch you up. Why are you touching me? What's the point? What's the point? What's the point? What's the point? I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of you either, my brother. I'm not afraid of you. Don't touch me. Come on, come on, show me. You don't try to touch me. Intimidate the peace, brother. Bro, bro, bro. What is wrong with these people? What's the point? What's the point? What is the problem? What's the point? What's the point? No, 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 why are you insulting hot heads? I have and there's nothing you can do! There's nothing you can do, bro! There's nothing you can do, bro! Why do you have to defend the man? You're not Kelly in front of you! Why do you have to defend the man? Why do you have to defend the man? Why do you have to defend the man? You have a spirit of violence, you try to use violence to justify it. Yes, you serve. Of Satan, so you are intimidated when the word of God is being preached in a conversation. Is really the spirit in you is vexed. And if you say Jesus is God, God step with His own mother. And bro, so you know, God, God bless you. God bless you. I know. I know you guys. Why would you God bless you? Absolutely. Oh, God bless you. Oh, the word of God. I never touched him. I never touched him. Touched him. I never touched him. I never touched him. He touched me. No, no, I never touched him. As God is my witness, I never touched. No, 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 brother. This is what he did. I'm not. This is what he did. I didn't touch him. I did not touch him. I would never touch him. He's a hothead. He comes I would never touch him. You don't understand. Causing trouble. I just want to make it clear. Bro, I'm not a scapegoat. I'm not being trouble. He has every right to say what he wants to say. It's a free world. Everyone does it. That's fine. Everyone does it. If we're satanic demons, that's fine. Yes, we've all done it. Let God deal with that. We've all done. But you don't intimidate let's, people. Let's, let's, let's. Okay, we can calm it down. Now. We can calm it down. I'm chill. We can all calm it down. I'm chill. And if you're talking about Satanism, right? But if you're saying Jesus is God, hold on, hold on, hold on. I have made it very clear that I serve the Lord Jesus okay. Christ. So if you're saying Jesus is God, no apologies. There is only one truth. That's it. You're saying Jesus is God. How could he have a mother? And how could he speak with his mother? Exactly. Run away. How could Jesus speak with his own mother? How could Jesus speak with his own mother? Apologizing for the Jesus, 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 Jesus Christ is Lord. How? He said we love for them. I'm having a conversation with Mary. If you want to discuss next week, Jesus Christ is Lord. You're drunk, bro. You're drunk. Go sober up. Go sober up. Evidence. Evidence. Where's your evidence? We bless your name. You are the Lord of Lords. And there is no other God. You are the Lord. God is fucking drunk. You are the Lord. There is no other God but you, Jesus. You are Lord. You are Master. You are King. There is no other God but you. He's a Guinness. He's a fucking Guinness. 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 What is this? 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 I love you, I love you, I love you, I love Shaky, 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 shaky. Come on, why? Why would you do that? I'm not being rude. Yeah, then, then it's just nice. Yeah, no, it's not. It's just nice. What about you? What about you? What about me? Do you know what? Fantastic conversation. Love it. Love it. I appreciate the fact that you tried to... It was enlightening. It was educational. You know, and the divinity of Christ. And and you guys were civil. Yeah. And it's brilliant. And all we wanted to do was sit down there and just listen. Yeah. But we kept on having these interferences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so a shame. It just shows you're doing the right thing. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. So one, what I just, just cut, I'm getting it. I suggest we stop now. Yeah. We've attracted the wrong kind of crowd. Hey, Bob, what alcohol so, did you drink, man? What was it? Whichever one you think in your fantasy. So you tell me you're the one that's coming up with it. Well, you're calm you now. See, see how calm you are. Wait, wait. After you I drink, you're calm. Me, so, did you go chest? 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 Did you go chest?
you drink that tell wine? Me. Did you drink that wine? And that little cracker. You tell me which drink. Which drink did that? Please tell me. Go on. Which drink did I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. Your friend said Guinness. Now ask your friend why he knows what Guinness smells like. So one of, the, one of the points that I raised about things that came after Moses, sorry, that, that, that are connected to Moses, that come yes. after Moses, that find their way in the Bible, yes. one of the reasons why I say that is it talks about Moses being buried in the books of Moses. Yes. And I think that that was written post-Moses by Jews under the guidance of the Holy Spirit into the books of Moses. Right, so we would say that Moses was dictated letter by letter by God yeah. to write down and God told him to write about his own death. Fair enough, and I, I, I'm, don't get me wrong, there are Christians that will completely agree with that. And I am not going to argue with those Christians. Fair enough. But I think that there are parts in the, fight, the in the Tanakh that come after Moses, they're still under inspiration. I mean, we believe that the whole of Nakh, right, the prophets of the writings were after Moses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, no, the sorry, sorry the, the, the five books of the Torah, sorry. Yeah. Um, getting all my terms mixed up today. But there are parts of the Torah that come after Moses, they're still under inspiration, they weren't necessarily written by Moses, but they maybe have said by Moses and remembered by the community and written by the community after Moses. Right. One of them being Moses was buried. Right. So that's what I was talking about, I just want to right. clarify okay. on that. Right. Yeah, I was a bit confused when you said that. Yeah. Because um, it sounded almost like a documentary hypothesis, but hopefully not. Well, I mean, th th there is a documentary hypothesis. I haven't come to a, a solid conclusion about it. Sorry, I'm just checking that. Let me, let me just... Come next week, he's got it. I mean, I've had this. I've had this. But you haven't had this with this guy. Yeah, you haven't. Yeah, we're always. No, me and you always fight. We haven't had this discussion. Because at the end of the day, when I see you, you're always disrespectful. But today, today, you're not disrespectful at all. You're not saying this, you're not saying that. Well, I come at you, Bob. You're so disrespectful. Well, how about next week? How about next week? Me and you have a nice conversation. Jesus Christ. God willing. Right. Great. Have a good day. Yes, I shall. In, in your imagination, <laughs> could you imagine porch? Because that's my favourite drink. That's all right. Don't want to give you church. Yeah. When you accuse, when you accuse me of drinking, you always accuse me of drinking pork because that's a classic drink. I smell that at your breath and your car. Yeah. And, and the only thing makes I know that's totally impossible. Little wine or something. <laughs> you, you can come with us to have a drink if you like. No, 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 no. I, I couldn't possibly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Have a have a have a think about. You know, my point that there's whole descriptions of the Messiah that, that Jesus is the only candidate in history that has fulfilled them. That, of course, all depends on the authority to interpret. True. Oh, yeah, just before I go, show me the verse in the Bible that says the rabbis have the interpretation. Oh no, here it is. Okay. So it says in chapter Deuteronomy chapter twenty. Yeah. I'll go from verse. I'll go from verse. No, it's not in this chapter at all. First one. Could be in the next chapter. It's all right. Find it another time. All right then. Yeah, we'll have a talk about it. Because okay. I think that this question of authority is really important. Yeah, I think it is. You know. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, actually a lot of, of of what this is boils down to is who do we see Jesus as being? Right. I think I think it's more to do with who do we see 
is because a lot of it boils down to interpretation. Yeah. So I think it all boils down to who has the authority to interpret. Yes, and I would say the Messiah has the authority to interpret. Right. I would say Jesus is that Messiah. And I would say the Messiah hasn't come yet. <laughs> <laughs> and and then do, well, you've got to under you, you, you then you've got to explain to me why Jesus Christ fits so many of the descriptions of the Messiah. That's something that you have to do. Right. Like, it's not just enough to say there are other prophecies. Why is it that Jesus Christ is the one that, that fits so many of these meta-narrative descriptions? Like, a Jewish man who's going to be king of Gentiles, who brings them to the worship of the one God, and brings them to Jerusalem to worship that one God. I mean, of course, These are huge meta-narratives, and Jesus is embodying them. So, I only agree with your premise that that has happened if the bit, like based on the premise that they are in fact worshiping God, God that's something that you made clear earlier but of course we would dispute that anyway but it, it, the God on, on, on more of a on, on more of a, a more of a theological basis as to whether or not um, one essence being shared by three persons yeah. is is can be considered to be one God it, it, it's with the greatest of respect just as with Muslims it doesn't matter what Muslims or Jews say about what I believe I know what I believe because I know what the church uh, teaches. I know that you believe in one God. And the church believes in one God. I know, I, know that, I know that the church believes, right? That's what they believe in is one God. Yes. The question then is, is that in fact? That's like me turning around to you and saying that you don't believe in one God. Because it is. That's like, exactly. And if I turn around to you and said, you don't believe in one God because I've got a three point philosophical argument why you don't believe in one God, at the end of the day, you're just going to turn around because you know in your heart that you've been taught ever since you were knee high to a grasshopper that you believe in one God and you know you believe in one God. So it doesn't matter how clever my arguments are, even if I came up with a brilliant three point argument as to why Jews don't believe in one God, you will know that that argument fundamentally mentally is wrong. Right. And it's the same with me. It does not matter how clever the argument of any Jew or Muslim. When they say to me I believe in three gods, I know that they're wrong. Right. Because the church has never taught me to believe in three gods. Ever. Absolutely. So your clever arguments are irrelevant to what I believe. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. Do, do you understand that? Yeah, I, I do understand. Would you agree with me that there is no clever argument that anyone could ever make, no matter how clever, even if it was the cleverest of all the clever arguments that have ever been said about what Jews believe, that there's no clever argument that could ever prove that Jews believe in one God? So Jews... <laughs> Jews believe in more than one God. Yeah. Would you agree that there's yeah. no clever argument that can prove Jews believe in more than one God? I, I, I agree with you. Right. Well, take it from me. There's no clever argument that can prove to me I believe in three gods. You're going to be wasting your time. You're welcome to try. But even if I... Let's just say you stumped me in the argument. I will still just turn around and go, but I believe in one God. Right. Because the church teaches me to believe in one God. Okay, hey. All right, all right, it's lovely. Have a lovely day. It's nice speaking to you. Nice speaking to you. God willing, we'll speak again. Okay, all right. All right, this, this is us. I'm going to go. Take care. God bless you. So, that was an interesting conversation with Josh. It's an interesting conversation with Josh. Um, in which we see one of the fundamental differences boils down to authority. Who has the authority to decide what is Old Testament prophecy? This is why Christians have to have faith in the church as authority to interpret scripture. Um, without which, on what basis do we say what is prophecy and what is not? You know, the church that wrote the New Testament believed that it had the authority to interpret the Old Testament to show which were prophecies of the Christ. By, by, and, 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 and obviously Josh believes that rabbis have that same thing. I think what's important to recognize is that there's no Jew in history, apart from Christ Jesus, that, um, that fits the description of a Messiah who will be acclaimed a king of Israel, who will be acclaimed a king of the Gentiles, who will bring them to the worship of Yahweh, and who will bring them to the, um, the worship at, at Jerusalem.
Jesus Christ is the only person that fits that description and most importantly he's the only one that could fit the prophecies of the Messiah that are connected to the temple because the temple is something that is now non-existent which means that without that temple no other person can fit those prophecies now I've got to hold my hand up when we went to I think it was the the passage about Joshua I flummoxed a little and my mind reached for something off the shelf and I mixed up two arguments the uh, death of Moses and the things in that are found in the book of Moses that I think are post Moses but still under inspiration and the idea of uh, a documentary thesis i.e. two sets of kinds of documents that are weaved together and, and, and I fluffed that one um, so I, I just want to hold my hand up about that um, but as we saw from speaking to Joshua Christ can fit into, for example, Deuteronomy 18.15. But Joshua will admit that Muhammad cannot fit that prophecy. So there you go, Muslims. From the mouth of a Jew that you love to quote, you love to quote the Jews, he's saying that Christ could fit the Deuteronomy, a prophet like unto Moses, but Muhammad couldn't. Um, and we saw from an, our discussion on a number of different other passages that Christ can sit in there. But what we really what need to talk about in more detail, I think, as well as the question of authority, is the question of theophanies, the question of God entering into his creation and the identity of the angel of the Lord.